Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Please come in. Have a seat. The convocation is about to begin. Good morning. That was pretty weak. Good morning. Okay, you got, you got a pulse. Congratulations. I'm Dr. Lee Cheek, Dean of the School of Humanities and Social Sciences, and welcome to the 2018 East Georgia State College Convocation. I would simply, on behalf of the Convocation Committee, ask that you avoid taking um, photographs uh, with, with flash components. Uh, I also ask that we all act as young men and women, young men and male and female scholars in the search of the truth today because we have a great speaker and a great event. I'd also like to take about two seconds and thank the Convocation Committee. It is chaired by Dr. Wedenkamp and myself, Professor Ansley, Dr. Cato, Joe Kennedy, Lisa Cassidy, Professor Lynn Hoke, Professor Ken Homer, Professor Bob Marsh, Caitlin Moore, Kimberly Page, Crystal Perry, Dr. Sega and Professor David Strickland. Thank you very much for planning this event that actually began over a year ago. We thank you for that hard work. Uh, today, we have a great speaker, uh, Mr. Will Storr, who's crossed the pond to come to be with us to talk about this amazing book that he's written called Selfie that impacts us and impacts our culture and the world around us. Um, let me just mention also that there will be a time of, of questions uh, after the formal talk and the first few people to ask questions, I'm gonna give you a present on the, on the part of the Convocation Committee. I'm gonna give you a copy of Selfie that you can read and enjoy and learn from. Also, this event will end at 12 o'clock. You will not be late for your next class. Do not, do not feel like you have to leave uh, in 30 minutes. We will take care of you. This is an academic function. This is meant to initiate the academic year to help you think about the higher potentialities of knowledge and of engagement and of learning. So this is an event for you and for our academic community. So ladies and gentlemen, please allow me in that spirit to introduce our president, Dr. Robert Bomer. Good morning, East Georgia State College. Welcome to the Luck Flanders Gambrell Auditorium. I had the pleasure in Atlanta yesterday to talk with Senator David Gambrell, and I told him about this event today, and the thought that he shared with me right away as I told him about the topic of, the converse, of our conversation today that's going to be led by Mr. Will Storr, was he went immediately to the concept of service, of looking beyond ourselves and to serving the community that makes this college possible, and made me think about what's happening out on the East Coast right now with Hurricane Florence and the kind of impact that's likely to have on people very close to us. So as you listen to Mr. Storr today, I hope all of us are thinking in the back of our heads about how can we turn this conversation today into some concrete ideas about how we can, as a community, help some way in the recovery from this monster storm that's going to be affecting people very close to us. So I'd ask you to keep that all in mind. I would like now to turn the program over to Dr. Deborah Vess. Uh, Dr. Vess is, as you know, our Vice President for Academic and Student Affairs, and we're very fortunate to have her in that role. Uh, she's got 21 years of experience in the university system of Georgia, having uh, served before at Georgia Perimeter College and at Georgia College and State University. And Dr. Vess is a true uh, champion of the liberal arts 
and of a liberal education that we celebrate today. Dr. Vess. Thank you, Dr. Bomer. It's wonderful to see everyone here, and welcome to East Georgia State College. I hope you're having a wonderful first semester with us, and I think that this is a wonderful event to really kick that off for you. I'd like to ask David Strickland, please, to come down to the front. David is the director of the first year experience and the instructor for the CATS course, which many of you are taking now. This convocation and induction ceremony celebrate the transition that is taking place in your lives at this very moment. And because of your achievements, you have reached a personal and educational milestone. It's now time for you to join with generations of East Georgia State College students who came before you to this campus in the pursuit of knowledge, discerning judgment, and responsible action. So I'd like to ask you to stand now while Mr. Strickland leads you in the Bobcat Pledge. Excellent. You have earned a place in a community where learning and service is our purpose and the ideas expressed in the Bobcat Pledge are our guideposts. Welcome to the community of scholars. And now I'd like to also welcome to the podium Dr. Jimmy Weddenkamp. He is Dean of Mathematics and Natural Sciences. Dr. Wedenkamp has been at this institution for almost two decades now, and his leadership has been pivotal in the establishment of a bachelor's in biology, uh, RN to BSN uh, in nursing, and many, many other ways. So, Dr. Wedenkamp. Thank you, Dr. Vess, and congratulations to our students. I'd like to, for us to give the students another round of applause. I had the opportunity to spend most of the day yesterday with Mr. Storr. We had lunch together. We and during that, that period of time, I'll share with you. One is that Mr. Storr was held captive for a very short period of time in the Sudan during uh, doing his investigative work uh, on the Civil War there. That's quite exciting. Second thing I learned is that Mr. Storr is a dog lover. He has a Labradoodle. If you've never seen a Labradoodle, you need to see a Labradoodle. They're very cute. My wife wants one. But the third and most important thing that I learned from Mr. Storr was that he has a great passion for writing. When we spoke about his book, his eyes widened, the tenor of his voice changed, the tone changed. You could tell that he really loves what he does. And I want to mention that because the students in the audience, if you can find something that you love to do and you're really good at it, you'll never work a day in your life. It really it was quite spectacular to meet someone who has that much passion for their work. Mr. Storr is an award-winning journalist and novelist. His works have appeared 
in The Guardian Weekend, The Sunday Times Magazine, and Esquire. He is the author of four critically acclaimed books and teaches popular journalism and storytelling classes in London at Guardian Master Classes and the Faber Academy. He's ghostwritten top 10 selling, top 10 best selling books for public figures, including two that became number ones. He's been invited to present his science of storytelling workshop all over the world, from Bangkok to Istanbul to the European Parliament. He's reported from the Civil War in South Sudan, the narco ganglands of Guatemala, and remote Aboriginal communities in Australia. He's been named New Journalist of the Year, Feature Writer of the Year, and has won a National Press Club Award for Excellence. His investigation into the kangaroo meat industry won the AFM Award for Best Investigative Journalism and he's been presented with the One World Press Award and the Amnesty International Award for his work on sexual violence against men. He's also won the AIB Award for Best Investigative Documentary for his BBC radio series. Please welcome Mr. Will Storr. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I've got got two microphones on. That's better, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk today um, uh, really about um, the journey that I went on to uh, make the book Selfie. And, and, and really, it's the story of all of us. It's a story of kind of how we came to be the people we are today um, in the West. And the, the, what got me kind of um, interested in this area were, were a lot of statistics that were coming out about young people around your age, both in the UK and in the US and in Canada. Um, and, and some of the, the statistics that have been coming out have been really quite troubling, really quite alarming. So we're living in a world today in which more people die by suicide than all the wars, murders and government executions combined. So suicide is, is killing more people than all of those other things which you know, are constantly at the top of the news agenda. And it's getting worse. So in the US, suicide um, recently hit a 30-year um, high. Uh, between the years 2008 and 2015, um, hospital treatments for um, self-harm in young people doubled. Um, uh, in 2016, a survey found that nearly a quarter of um, young people between the ages of 7 to 10 felt they needed to be perfect. And by the time they'd grown up and were hitting the ages of 11 to 21, there was 61% of young people felt they needed to be perfect in order to kind of be accepted. Um, uh, between 2009 and 2016, um, the increase in American college students uh, who felt um, uh, overwhelmed, is 51% increase and a 95% increase in people your age um, uh, saying they felt depressed. So that's just a, a, just a horrible bunch of um, figures. That, what the hell's going on? Um, so so that, was, um, that was the beginning of my journey, really. That was the beginning of my journey to find out what was going on. And the first clue I had, uh, the, the, what I wanted to do was find out what have all these things got in common. So it's not only suicide that's gone up, it's self-harm, eating disorders, um, uh, depression, um, uh, body dysmorphia, uh, uh, you know, body um, like anorexia, bulimia, all these things are up and up and up and up. And what the, all of those things have got in common is this idea of perfectionism. Um, so, so perfectionism is a predictor of all these terrible things. And, and, and the definition of, of perfectionism, if you're a perfectionist, if you have perfectionistic thoughts, it's you have unrealistically high expectations for yourself. And of course, that's, that's bad because when you fail to meet those expectations, um, you, you blame yourself. You think, oh my God, I'm a loser, I'm a failure. And nobody wants to feel like that, obviously. Um, uh, so, um, uh, uh, and recently, just th this was a very recent study that came out in 2018. They found that between 1989 and 2016, there'd been a 33% increase in um, young people saying they needed to display perfection in order to, sec to secure approval. So I thought, well, that's it. This is the problem, it's perfectionism. So where does this idea come from? And to find out that, I had to find out, you know, where, really where all the ideas that underpin everything we think about in the West come from. 
And it was a real wake up to me because it, it's about really about culture and about how culture, our culture, influences kind of the way we think and the way we see the world. And before, like most people, I just thought culture is like, it's the stories that we tell, it's operas, it's plays, it's all that kind of boring stuff. But actually what I found out is that culture is much more important than that. Our, our culture becomes part of us. It becomes literally a part of the structure of our brain, especially between the ages of five to seven when our parents are telling us all these kind of stories and um, telling us you know, what good people do, what bad people do, what men do, what women do, giving us all these ideas about what human life is like. Um, it, it becomes embedded into the structure of our brains and it becomes the way that we see the world. And so in the West, we, we, we live in, in, a, in a very specific and unusual culture and it's called individualism. And that's the beginning of the journey which has kind of led us to these sort of slightly troubling places. And so individualism began two and a half thousand years ago in ancient Greece. And, and the psychologist has got this really amazing theory as to how that happened. Um, so ancient Greece was a, was a really weird, unusual environment because it, it's all like tiny little um, cities and villages on little rocky islands or little rocky kind of seaside towns. So in ancient Greece, you couldn't be a part of a big farming community to survive. You had to be a hustler. You had to get out of there off your own back and you know, be like, be a, uh, make olive oil or, 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 or hunt or um, be like a fisherman. So you had to kind of, you couldn't be a part of a big community like in China where you were a part of a big rice growing community or a big kind of wheat farmer. You had to be a self-starter to, to survive. And, and, and from that environment became this kind of um, culture which kind of, worshipped the idea of the individualist self-starter. So in ancient Greece, you start getting um, people worshipping the physical kind of form, and you had statues in, the, you know, in public places of perfect male forms, perfect female forms. And the amazing thing is that you could take one of those statues from two and a half thousand years ago and put them on the front of Men's Health magazine. And uh, apart from the fact they're made out of stone, they would look perfectly like ordinary. They look perfectly good. So we started worshipping the individual. Um, you know, the, the democracy happened in ancient Greece, where the individual got the power to decide who was going to rule the country, which is like a revolution. Two and a half thousand years ago, it's Game of Thrones world. It's kings and tyrants and people being killed. So it's an amazing thing that happened. Ancient Greece is also where the story of Narcissus came up. You know, they, they became so self-obsessed. They had to start. They, they, this myth came up about about this guy Narcissus that fell in love with his own image, and he was so upset. He was so devastated when he found that um, he couldn't marry himself that he ended up dying. I mean, it's a weird story, but they, but that, but, that, but that's how much of a, of a problem it became. And, and this other idea came up in ancient Greece, which is still with us today, and it's called Kalokagathia. And Kalokagathia means beautiful and good. And there was this idea that came up that you can judge how um, good somebody is, that you can judge their moral worth by looking at their physical body. So it, th this connection came about between how we look physically and what we think about each other. And of course, that's a really toxic, nasty idea. And it's a still an idea that's very much with us today. And that, that was amazing when I found that stuff out because... Again, like, I'm not particularly interested in ancient Greece. Two and a half thousand years ago is boring. But when you, when you see how many of the ideas that came about back in those days are still not only with us today, but, they, you know, they're, they're, they're in our heads. You, you can't think your way out of these ideas. Like, you know, people want to be thin. And you, and you can tell yourself, well, you know, it's bad that I want to be thin. I should, I should, I should have any body that I want. But, you, you know, you, but, but these feelings are still kind of embedded in the way we're kind of looking at and, and kind of seeing the world. So that's where it all comes from. That's where individualism comes from, the worship of the individual. And um, there's lots of really good things about individualism. So, so one of the things about individualism is, is, is that we empower the individual. So it's not about um, the group. It's about you. You've got, to go to go, you've got to go out there and achieve and be amazing. And that's fantastic. And we, and people, and we do that. And there's lots of really good... Um, uh, 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 so, you know, the, the, the West has lots of amazing... Um, advancements because of this idea of individualism. You look at the towns and the cities and the, uh, and the amazing uh, technological achievements which individualism has, has driven. But there's also lots of really bad things about individualism because we're very good at praising the individual when they succeed. So we, in the West, we say that Steve Jobs invented the iPhone. And, and when we think about the iPhone, we think, oh, isn't Steve Jobs an amazing guy? But Steve Jobs didn't invent the iPhone. Loads of people <laughs> invented the iPhone. It's a big group activity. So, so what we, we tend to pick out the individual and make the individual the hero, and that's wrong. Um, 
but that's what we do. But we also blame ourselves for our failures, and that's where the kind of some of these toxic ideas come in. So, so when we succeed, we go, yeah, I'm brilliant, I'm amazing, and we forget all the people that helped us get there. But, uh, but, but when we um, fail, we also blame ourselves, and that's when you start getting these problems, what with suicide and self-harm and eating disorders um, and so on. So, 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 so that's where it all comes from, um, ancient Greece. And then um, it, it becomes accelerated in the 1980s. So one of the things that surprised me again when I was looking through all this recent history was just how, um, how collective we became in the, in the 20th century. Like in the West, we think of ourselves as these individualists and it's all about kind of individual freedom. But actually, after the, after the wars and after the um, Great Depression in the, in the US, in America and in the UK, we all became quite collective. We, all, we, we, we had lots of different kind of policies. Um, uh, th so there was lots of unionization, there was high taxation, lots of regulation on banking and business. And it all combined to create this environment where it was much more about the collective, people helping each other. Uh, there was the era of the jobs, jobs for life and the, the corporation that you worked for had to look after you and there was great pension schemes. And out of this kind of very collective worldview in the US and in the UK came a collective form of self. So in the 50s, there was the idea of corporation man. And um, you know, everybody was looking the same, coming out of their commuter trains and dressing the same and having their, having their um, job for life. And then corporation man had kids and the kids were the hippies. And the hippies were so unbelievably collective, you know, like so they, they, they embraced Eastern philosophy. And of course, in, in the East, the East is where this kind of collective worldview really exists um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of very pure state. And, and, and the hippies were very anti-materialistic, anti-corporate kind of rebels. That's how they saw themselves. They weren't into personal possessions. They weren't into wealth. They were kind of the opposite of, of who we are today. Um, and that was all fine and it all worked um, until the 1970s. And in the 1970s, there was an, it was sort of catastrophe and disaster. The economies of the West started falling to pieces for lots of um, sort of quite complex reasons uh, which economists still argue about. Um, but it doesn't really matter. Um, but but um, everything started falling to pieces. So the, the, the politicians uh, in the West had to come up with a new idea. They had to sort of think, you know, everything's going wrong. We need to rescue the West. We need to come up with a new idea with which to organize people. And... It has a kind of complex name, this new idea, but I'm going to explain it. And the new, it, they call, it's called neoliberalism. So neoliberalism is a kind of new freedom. And so neoliberalism is kind of this idea of going back to ancient Greece. It's like going back to these ideas of ultra-individualism. And, um, of course, Reagan was the, was the guy that you had in the, in the 80s, and our version of Reagan was Margaret Thatcher, was our, our great reforming prime minister. And in 1981, Margaret Thatcher was interviewed, and she gave a really quite sinister interview to the Sunday Times. So the journalist said to her, all right, Margaret Thatcher, what, what's your plan? You know, everything's going wrong. Um, yeah, there are power cuts. There's, there's garbage lining the streets. Everyone's out of work. What are you going to do about it? And she said, well, um, the thing that's annoyed me about all the policy that's been um, going on over the uh, uh, you know, last few decades is it's all, it's all been towards the collective self. So but that she meant, you know, it was all about unionization and regulations on banking and business to make sure that people weren't exploited. Um, and she said, we want to get rid of all that. And this is something quite sinister. She said, um, uh, the, the, the project is economics, but the object is to change the soul. And by that she meant, so I'm going to change the, way, the, the, the ways in which people have to behave in order to make a living. Uh, and by doing that, I want to change people. I want to change the character of the West. And it's sinister, because that is exactly what she did. That's exactly what happened. So Thatcher and Reagan went to war with the collective self. They got rid of the unions. Um, in, in the UK, there was this almost like a, 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 a um, just like a, almost like a, a war when, with, the, with, the, with the mining unions, and there was like pitched battles in the street. Blood was shed. Over here, um, there was a battle. I think it was with the Air Traffic Controllers Union. It was a similar symbolic war. Um, uh, and once these unions were kind of crushed, their power was diminished. Thatcher and Reagan sold lots of publicly owned industries and made them private. They got rid of all the banking, um, not all of them, <laughs> most of the, like, like, got, got rid of huge amounts of regulations on banking and business, which, which kind of uh, enabled them to um, uh, make profits much more easily, but relieve them of the kind of responsibility of looking after people. And it worked. It worked for a while, you know, like um, 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 uh, we, uh, the economies recovered. Uh, and we, 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 everything began to kind of stabilize. But there was a cost. And so remember, you know, culture, what, one of the ways to think about culture is 
So the question that every brain asks after it's been born uh, is this. It's, it, it, it's basically, who do I have to be in this particular place in order to get along and get ahead? So humans are born with kind of half-finished brains. Um, uh, it's why we have such extended childhoods, because the brain is still half-formed, and we, 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 there's a lot of work that goes on with the brain looking out into the world and finding out who exactly it has to be in order to thrive. And it's in those childhood years when the rules of our culture become sort of packed into our heads and we start seeing the world in these very specific ways. Um, and back in the 70s, who you had to be was we just had to get a job and you're going to be fine. And, you know, and if you didn't get a job, there was lots of welfare out there that were going to look after you, so that was fine. And then suddenly it changed. In the 1980s, who you had to be to get along and get ahead was, a, was tough because it was, it was not easy anymore. Um, you had to be, again, like in ancient Greece, a hustler. You had to push yourself forwards. And it began to change who we were as a people really, really quickly. So, so it, they, they started changing these policies in 1980. And in 1982, there was the first signs that things were changing um, in, in, in the nature of the Western self. And one of the first signs was in um, the ways that we were naming our children. So there's a very brilliant psychologist called Dr. Dr. Um, Professor Jean Twenge, and she did, a, she, she, she did a study on baby names. And so for, for, for centuries in the UK and in the US, Parents have been naming their children ordinary names like Jennifer, you know, George, all those boring names. But in 1982, they started noticing people were starting to name their kids differently. They were giving their names like weird spellings, unusual spellings, unusual names. And the idea was that they, that they suddenly wanted their children to stand out and be a star. They wanted them to be, you know, these hustlers, these kind of pushy little kids. Um, uh, also in the early 1980s, Keep Fit became a big sudden thing that came out of nowhere. Jane Fonda. She released a workout video that sold a million copies on, uh, on VHS. And again, that's another thing that's never left us. We know we're still living in this world. Keep fit and wellness is a massive part of our world today. Um, having unusually named children is still a big, big, big thing that we do because we're still in this kind of era of neoliberalism. So things started changing really, really quickly. When you ask young people what they wanted to, what they wanted to achieve in life, they started saying, I want to be rich. They started saying, I want to be a celebrity, which had never happened before in, 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 the, in the history of the West. So, so, so things started kind of changing really rapidly. And if you think about, if you think about who we were in, a, like in America um, in, in, in like 1965 versus who we were in 1985, it's a completely different person. Only 20 years has, has gone. It's, it's a heartbeat of time. It's a blink. But in 1965, we were these collectively minded hippies smoking pot and you know, um, thinking, oh, I don't want to get a job, I don't want to serve the man. It's all about collective, collectiveness and all that stuff. And then in 1985, we were walking down Wall Street with red braces on saying greed is good. Like, it's unbelievable, this revolution that happened in just 20 years. And of course, you've got to think about what changed between 1965 and 1985. The economy did. That's what changed. Who we had to be in order to survive was changed radically, and, and we changed along with it. So who we were completely uh, transformed. Um, now, into this kind of new environment of kind of push yourself first, me versus me individualism, um, came a brand new idea. And that idea was about self-esteem. So this, this idea came popular in the 1980s, that, 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 that in order to raise amazing children, we had to convince our children that they were amazing. And that was it. It was going to be as simple as that. If we, if we raised our children to believe they were amazing, they would just become amazing. It sounds like a really silly idea, but that's, that's what they believed. And, and, and the, um, the, the, one of the, the, the guys, the individuals that, that are responsible for this idea coming to prominence was a really interesting man called John Vasconcellos. And John Vasconcellos was an American politician that had a really um, unusual background. So he'd been a bit of a hippie. He'd been raised in a very strict Roman Catholic um, background. Um, and, in, and in his sort of Roman Catholic background, you, you know, you're raised to believe it's not about individuals. It's, it's, you're, not, you're not raised to believe you're amazing. You're, a, you're raised to believe that you're terrible and you're a sinner and that you're going to go to, you know, that you need to kind of uh, uh, constantly ask God for forgiveness. And um, then he had this sort of big nervous breakdown. He'd become a very successful politician at a very young age. And um, the way he told it, he, his level of success kind of challenged his kind of self hating views, and he had this big breakdown. And he'd, um, and he'd um, discovered um, this, this strain of psychology that was popular in 1970s America called humanistic psychology. And humanistic psychology said that 
um, uh, that humans were just fantastic and amazing, and we only used 10% of our brains. And imagine what could happen if we tap into the other 90%, we'd become like superheroes. Now, by the way, this idea is not true. I don't know who came up with this idea that we only use 10% of our brains. We use 100% of our brains. Like, it's complete nonsense. But he bought this idea completely. Um, and um, and he, he felt like it had healed him. And then when he became a powerful politician, he thought, well, you know what? I want to heal California. I want to spread this idea around California um, that people are amazing, and in order to, to, to be amazing, they just had to st you know, stop hating themselves and, and believe in their amazingness. And because he was a very powerful politician, he, he could do this. And that's what he did. So he, um, he managed to persuade his boss to give him three quarters of a million dollars to pay for a three-year task force that was going to look into this idea of self-esteem. Um, and he got his money. And when he got his money, everybody went crazy because they just thought, this is ridiculous. So all the newspapers all over America and indeed around the world started attacking Vasco, uh, Vasconcelos, telling him, basically calling him an idiot. The New York Times said it was crazy. The LA Times said maybe we should just give people the money. That would make them happier than... Uh, than, uh, than this crazy, um, this, this crazy uh, um, uh, scheme that we've been funding. Um, and Vasconcello went crazy. He was furious about this. He felt completely humiliated. Um, and when journalists said, you know, said, you know, what do you think the problem is? He said, well, the problem is all these journalists that are, that are mocking me. They've got low self-esteem. And, um, and, um, and they need to sort their kind of self-esteem out. So, so he was completely convinced that he was right um, in, in kind of promoting this idea. Um, and he was determined that he was going to change what people thought about this idea. So part of this whole task force, part of the project was that they were going to um, prove that, so, that self-esteem was, he called it, a social vaccine. And if you give people self-esteem, then that you're going to cure domestic violence, homelessness, unemployment, um, drug abuse, gang warfare was a big thing in LA at the time, as probably still is really. Um, so you were going to get rid of all the gangs. Um, so he, he, was, he was promising the earth on the back of this idea. And now he was in trouble because he told the world that this was going to happen. The world had responded by um, laughing in his face. Johnny Carson, the comedian, did a whole week uh, um, uh, 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 of jokes about him on his, on his Tonight Show. Um, and so he, he became determined to prove that he was right. And so he said, oh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get all these academics um, from the University of California system to look at the data. And they're going to prove, they're going to prove I'm right, that, that if you give children self-esteem, they just become amazing. Three years later, lo and behold, that's what he announces. He tells the world, we've done it. We've done it. We've proved it. Here's the kind of science. We've, we, we've proved that this idea of self-esteem is, is true. And the journalists couldn't believe it. They were, they were wrong. They've been proven wrong. So all the headlines changed. And Time magazine ran a cover saying the jeers are turning to cheers. Um, uh, or, uh, he, he was invited to the Soviet Union to talk to the communist Politburo about how to raise their self-esteem. Um, his, his PR people phoned up Oprah Winfrey and told them about this, and Oprah Winfrey decided the self-esteem was going to be the big catch-all phrase of the 1990s, and she had a big self-esteem special where they had uh, Maya Angelou and um, Drew Barrymore and John Vasconcellos talking about self-esteem. So it became like a viral idea, and people embraced it. It changed the way we taught our children. It changed the way we raised our children. So a whole my generation, I was raised to believe that in order to be happy and successful, you had to love yourself. There was the Whitney Houston song, the greatest love of all is me, me, I'm the greatest love of all. Um, but the problem was this idea was wrong. And um, what I wanted to do when I was researching my book was just to find out, because we, we know now that that idea is wrong, even though it's still very much with us. And I wanted to find out how it had happened. How on earth had we been conned to this, to this kind of extent? And I was amazed with what I found. So I flew to the, to, to, to the US and spent quite a lot of time looking through all the archives, because John Vasconcellos, is, he died a few years ago. But he's got a big personal archive at the, in the University of California, Santa Barbara. And in Sacramento, there's a, there's a self-esteem task force um, archive. So I spent, I spent weeks going through all these, all these papers. And um, uh, in amongst all those papers, I found a cassette tape. And, 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 on, and the cassette tape um, uh, was a recording of the meeting in which the scientist, the chief scientist that Vasco had um, recruited to, 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 to prove his idea was correct, he was presenting the results of the idea to the group. And I played the tape, and, on, and the tape had this guy, his name was Dr. Neil Smelser, telling the group exactly the opposite of what we'd been told. He said basically the, the evidence is... Um, um, uh, is um, uh, um, mixed, insignificant, or absent for, for what they wanted to uh, for what they wanted to uh, uh, show, which was the self-esteem caused all these amazing effects. So it was a real. I couldn't believe this had happened. 
So I tracked down um, some of the old members of the task force from back in the 80s. And one of these guys was, was, was a guy called David Shanahoff Kalser, who lives in um, Santa Barbara. And I went around to his house. And, um, and, I, I, and um, he's a really weird guy. Um, he's a really unusual uh, man. But, but I picked on him in particular because his task force had 25 members. And, and in the back of their report, which was telling the world that self-esteem was a real thing, he was the only one that hadn't signed it. Under his name, there was like a blank space. And I said to him, so why, why didn't you sign it, David? And he said, well, um, because it was all a lie. And it was a deliberate lie. And he said, I, I was sitting there two seats away from John Vasconcelos when he first saw this scientific data, and he saw that it wasn't meeting his expectations. And he said, if the, if the, if the legislature who fund them find out what's in these reports, they're going to pull on our funding. And he said, from that moment on, there was an enormous cover-up. So they started basically lying about it. And then I tracked down Vasco's right-hand man, a man called Andrew Mecca, and he gleefully admitted they did lie about it. They spent $30,000 on publicists trying to get this message out that the scientists had backed up what they were going to say, and it worked. And, so, so, and, it's, and, and what's amazing about this lie is that it changed everything, because people bought this idea. So you know, w one of the ways that um, the human brain works out how we're doing in, I I in life is that we, we, we look to other people. You know, we, we don't decide who we are. Uh, th there's an idea in psychology called the looking glass effect, and it's like we, we are who we think other people think we are. It's a bit of a complicated thing to say, but, but basically, we know when we're hanging out with people, we see how they're reacting to us, and that's how we work out who we are. We, we, well, we're this kind of person, and people think this of us. Okay, so what happens then if you take an entire generation of children and raise them by telling them they're amazing? Well, they come to believe that they're amazing, and that's exactly what you find in the psychological research. That, so this, this lie happened in 19, around 1989. This became a popular idea. And in 1990... Uh, among American college students, you start to see levels of narcissism going up a bit. And they keep going up, and they keep going up, and they keep going up all through the 90s, all through the 2000s, and carry on going up until around 2008, when they start plateauing. So this, this lie that John Vasconcelos spread changed who we are as a people. It's really quite extraordinary. It, 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 you know, it created a, gener a generation of, of young people who are much, much higher in narcissism than, than the previous. And, and you know, why that happened? Well, it's because their parents were telling them they were amazing. It's because their teachers were telling them they were amazing, and they were being protected from failure. Um, uh, so, so, so that's kind of what happened. And then, of course, what happens in, in, in amongst all of this stuff is we start getting cell phones. Um, it, it's quite extraordinary um, when you look at the history of, 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 of kind of cell phones and what they've done to us. So when, I, when, when um, Apple launched the iPhone, they were, uh, um, uh, uh, when, they, well, when they launched the first selfie camera, this was in 2010, um, they didn't launch it as a selfie camera. You know, when Steve Jobs does his things on the stage, they launched it as the front-facing camera. And the idea of the front-facing camera was that you were going to like have chats with your, with your nan on FaceTime. That's what they thought people were going to use it for. But of course, that's not what we used it for. What we used it for was taking pictures of ourselves <laughs> and, and showing them to the world. Um, th th there's an idea out there that kind of si that Silicon Valley and technology are, are kind of creating this kind of self-obsession in people. But, but I think that's completely wrong. I think it's our culture that has created this kind of um, elevated levels of self-obsession. And, and all that's happening with the technology is we're deciding, to, we're deciding how we use it. Um, and, and how we're using it is reflecting the self-obsession that's already there. Like, if you think about it, Silicon Valley, they're launching new stuff at us every day. Like, so many ideas are launched at us from Silicon Valley. 99% of them fail. Um, when Twitter launched, it was, it was really an idea to, to, to send free SMS messages. It was like a Skype, but for SMS. But that's not what we did with it. We, we decided that we're not going to use it for free SMS messages. We're going to start arguing with each other and, like building you know, all our Twitter followers up and, and, and all this stuff. So, 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 uh, but, but of course, what happens is that, is that, that um, it encourages the narcissism. It encourages the self-obsession, because you get addicted to it. You, you, when you start getting those little hits of approval, it's, like a, it's almost like a drug. You know, and, and you want it more and more and more and more and more, and, and it triggers you. You, know, you're, you get into arguments with people on, on Twitter, and, you, and, you, and you're driven to defend yourself, because there are arguments in front of everyone that you know, or your followers. So you're kind of triggered into this kind of like escalating rows. And, and of course, um, uh, you know, this is, this is just daily life today. This has become this kind of daily life. So, 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 so you, you know, my idea really in, in selfies is that you can't understand any of this stuff without rewinding back to first of the self-esteem movement of the mid-1980s and then 
rewinding back th further to what Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, how they changed our economy, and then really rewinding back two and a half thousand years to ancient Greece, to, 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 to the very roots of this idea that the individual is the kind of all-powerful thing that we should be thinking about um, uh, um, uh, um, more than anything else. It's the individual, it's individual kind of success that's, that, that's the most important thing. Um, and, and, and I think the, 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 the damaging lie that has come out of the self-esteem movement is this, and I was brought up with this idea, and I think you all, you've all heard this idea before, and the idea is this, it's that you can do anything you want. You can be anyone you want. All you've got to do is try, right? That's not true. Not only is that not true, it's a toxic, damaging idea. Because if you want to be Beyonce and if you want to be Michael Jordan, well, I'm sorry, it's tough. Like, I mean, probably. <laughs> like, it probably is. And so if you remember what I was talking about half an hour ago, what's the definition of perfectionism? It's somebody is set, somebody has... has um, unrealistically high expectations for themselves, and they don't meet those expectations. And then what happens is and they, they go, well, it's my fault. It's because I didn't want it enough. It's because I didn't try hard enough. It's because my dreams weren't big enough. So they beat themselves up, and then, that, that, and then from that comes eating disorder. From that comes suicidal thoughts. From that comes self-harm. From that comes um, all of these terrible um, kind of self-attacking behaviors that are beginning to overwhelm um, young people all over the West, um, you know, Britain, UK, Canada, um, uh, and Europe. Um, so, 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 so this is a really, da really dangerous idea that we're, that, we're, that we're kind of swapping around at the moment. And it's dangerous because, as I said, you, you can't be whoever you want to be. It's just, it's just impossible. You can't, you can't just decide to be Beyonce and then you're Beyonce. I mean, that's just not how it works. And it's partly not how it works um, because of biology, because simply of, uh, you know, w when we're born, we're half finished but we're half, we're half set as well. And, and, and even our kind of personality that we're, that we're born with is a huge influence over who we end up um, you know, coming to be. Um, so, so I just want to sort of leave you with, 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 with a, a little bit of a less depressing thought than, <laughs> than that. Um, uh, to, to, you know, so, so the way I've come to think of it is this, is, is that um, the, the, the model of kind of perfection that we've been sold in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s is this one, is the self-esteem idea, is that you're amazing, you can do anything, you can be what you, you, can be what you want to be, and, 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 and if you're struggling in life, you've just got to try, 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 and you're gonna, you'll get there. Um, but, but I think that, 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 that's not accurate. And the way I've come to think of it is, is, is quite simply, okay, so, so how can we be happy if this, if this idea is false? What's, what's the correct model? And I think about a lizard, as weird as it sounds. If you put a lizard on an iceberg, the lizard is a miserable lizard. It's pretty unhappy. It's in a bad mood. If you take that same lizard and put it in the desert, the lizard is delighted. It's really happy. It's got all its food. The lizard hasn't changed whatsoever, but it's just the environment around it has changed. And I think that's the key. That's the secret of, of becoming more happy. Like it, it, it's, you, you can't become anybody that you want to be. You can't, by sheer force of will, force yourself to be happy. But if you're unhappy, it's about changing changing the life around you. That's the, that, that's the real um, key. Um, and one of the things that drives all humans is a fundamental human desire. If you look out into the world, you, you'd be forgiven for thinking the fundamental human desire is attention or money or one of these things. And it's not. Underneath all of these desires that we have is, is one controlling desire, and that is for status. Uh, it, sounds, it sounds like a cynical thing to say, but this is the, the, we've evolved to be a tribal animal, to exist in tribes, and, and, and what's important to humans is our sense of relative status in those tribes. And it's a, it's a human need, just like food and water and drink, is that we all need to have a certain feeling that we're quite good at something in the world, and, that, and that's what makes us psychologically happy. And I, and I think rather than trying to compete with the entire world and trying to be Beyonce or Michael Jordan or Obama or some amazing um, public figure, you, you, it's about finding out what you particularly are good at. It's about finding out what your particular little niche in the world is and focusing all your attentions at that. Because if you, if you try and compete with the whole world, you're just gonna be one of these statistics, I think, um, unless you really are a genuinely exceptional person. And if you are a genuinely exceptional person, I think it will be obvious by now. Um, so it's about finding out what that tiny corner of the world is that you, that you could be quite good at something. Um, uh, it sounds like a modest ambition, and it is to start off with, and that's the point. It's not an unrealistically high expectation. It's, I want to go into this little part of the world and be quite good, and then you, you, what you'll find is that you'll be quite good, and that's going to feel fantastic. And, you, and that's the little um, uh, uh, effort that you're going to be pursuing as you go through your lives. And then 
I don't know. To me, that's a much better model of how to end up with a happy, successful, thriving adulthood than these rather toxic ideas that we've all been bathed in since birth. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Hi. So my question to you is, um, we're like lizards, we have to find our niche. Yeah. With the phones and everything, with the environment that we are currently in, do you think that we as a people are going to move something, move in a cultural direction that's more accepting and we can find that, find that? Or do you think we're going to keep going on the current path and maybe crash and burn into the self-harm <laughs> I hate to be that. so depressing, but I, I think it's the latter. And, 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 it's for, uh, uh, and, it's, and it's because of how we've evolved. So, 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 so human evolution, we're, we're tribal creatures. And, we, and we've spent around 99% of our time on Earth living not in amazing towns and cities, but in um, groups of around 150 people. So, and we still, have the, we still have these Stone Age brains. That's why the world is so crazy and we're always fighting because we, we literally still have Pleistocene brains. Like, we haven't, our brains haven't evolved that much. So we've evolved to um, compete with around 150 people. That's, that's how we're wired up, right? So that's, that's, that's how we thrive. Um, but the problem with um, social media, especially Instagram, and Instagram has recently been found to be one of the most toxic platforms to, um, to, to be on, is, is, is that you're suddenly competing with Kim Kardashian. You're suddenly competing with Jennifer Lawrence. I mean, and, and so, as I say, it, it, it's unconscious. You, 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 but you're flicking through those feeds, and you know, there's Kim Kardashian, there's Jennifer Lawrence, and there's you. And it's like, that's, that, that, that's never going to be a healthy thing to do, because uh, it, you can't get out of it. That's how your brain functions. It compares you to the people it sees around you and goes, and if you're, and if you're driven to, complete, to constantly compare yourself to the most popular people in school, the best looking people in school, but also the most popular and best looking people in the world, it's never going to end in a good place. So that's why I think it's dangerous. Is it on? No, it ain't. All right. Hi. Hi. Um, what motivated you to write this book? It was, well, I was raised very much with the, with the self-esteem, in the self-esteem lie. You know, I was a teenager in the 90s and I, I got into all sorts of trouble when I was your age. Um, and, um, and, and the, the, constant, the constant message was, oh, it's because you've got low self-esteem. And I believed it. I bought this thing. And I, I spent decades trying to sort my self-esteem out. And then when I, found, um, when I did this research, I found out that, that, that actually low self-esteem, in inverted commas, is um, it, 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 it's associated with a personality type, which is called neuroticism. And, um, and so if you're high in this trait of neuroticism, you, you tend to have low self-esteem, and there isn't actually that much you can do about that. You're kind of stuck with that. So that's obviously a bit of a depressing thing to find out. But it was also quite annoying, because I felt like I'd wasted so much of my life. And, and, and so that was what motivated me. I wanted to find out how this, how this had happened. How, how would this lie had come to be and change everything? So that was my motivation. <laughs> Hello. Um, that makes a good question, because I had to come over like four people to get here. But so my question is, after everything you've said, um, a lot of things going on right now, participation trophies. Do you believe in them or do you not and why? Sorry, I didn't catch the middle bit. Um, participation trophies. Do you believe in them? Why or why not? Participation. Partic trophies. Trophies. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, yeah, oh, yeah, that's a good question. So, so self-esteem. So self-esteem isn't, isn't a bad thing. But, 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 but the mistake that they made um, it, back in the 80s was that, that, that they saw people who, um, uh, who got good grades at school also had high self-esteem. So they thought, well, if we give everybody high self-esteem, they're all going to get good grades. But that's not how it worked. It was the opposite way around. They had good high self-esteem because they had good grades. The good, grade came, good grades came first. So you need to give the participation trophies out to the people who have 
you know, have done really well. I mean, you know, we, we, uh, and so, so the self-esteem comes from achievement. So I think I, I do believe in participation process um, trophies, but, but it's got to be encouraging the people that have done, put loads of work in and, and actually increase their levels of competence because then it's healthy and then your self-esteem is working as it should be. So, so what the definition of narcissism is, 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 is this, I am special. I am better than everybody around me and I deserve to be treated that way. That's when it gets dangerous because it's based on nothing. So you've got the trophy just because, I don't know. Yeah, so that's, so that's, 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 that's. Do you think that we'll ever find a happy medium between self and selflessness or will we just keep tipping the scale back and forth? Sorry, you, do you think we're going to find a happy medium between self? self oh, self. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's going to be a, a journey, and I, I think, yeah, I, 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 do, I do think that. Um, so the self-esteem idea is kind of going away a little bit, um, but it's still it's still quite prevalent, especially in in, in schools. But certainly in the UK, it's still an idea that's still very much out there. Um, so I think that's got to change. Um, and I think, uh, and I think, really, um, what's got to change is that, is that we stop um, uh, trying to encourage everybody to be perfect and amazing at everything, and try to focus people's attention more on their individuality in the sense of you're different, and everybody's different. And so, you know, we, we hear a lot about diversity at the moment, which is great, and, but, but we're very focused on gender and race. But, but when you look at the psychology, there's a huge amount of diversity amongst individuals that go way beyond gender and race. You know, there's introverts and extroverts, and you're, you know, we have different personality types and different talents, and we ignore all those differences. But I think those differences are where a, a much more balanced approach lies, because w when you can find out what people are good at and what people are bad at, what, what, what kind of future is going to make a kid happy, and what kind of a future a kid's going to struggle at, then, then you've, got the, you've got the beginning of a much more kind of healthy kind of um, journey for them than the one that I think we have at the moment where everyone's kind of treated the same as if we're all our brains are the same and yeah I think that's the, that's the that's the problem hello hi when you spoke about the lizard you said the lizard didn't change yeah it was just happier yeah. so are in your opinion do you think that people cannot change I think that, that, that one of the problems with, the, with, with these ideas that were still um, possessing us is that, is that we have a massively over uh, exaggerated idea of how much change is possible. So when you look at when you look at personality, which is a huge um, part of who, who we end up being, is our personality. Once you once you're out of your adolescence, it's it's pretty much fixed, and your personality changes in very modest and predictable ways as you get older. You kind of become more bland as you get older. Basically, you kind of everything heads towards the middle, um, but very very subtly. And so this idea that came up in the 70s in America and California. Was that, was that people could, could radically change, they could transform themselves like that. And, and, and this is just bio, biologically untrue, you, you can't do it. That's not to say that people can't change in the sense that they can get, um, people get better at, better at doing the things they do. They also grow up, I mean, people mature at different rates. So that, that's a big change that people go through. But this idea that you, could, that you, can turn an, you cannot turn an introvert into an extrovert, like it's biologically impossible to do that. So, so, I, so I, I think that's, that, that's the cultural um, myth we've got to get over a bit. It, it, and, and that runs to the heart of that idea that anyone can be anything and do anything. And, it, and it's an unrealistic expectation that's causing such problems in people's mental health, I, th I think. Um, how does our geography into which we are raised affect our view of ourselves? Sorry, I didn't quite get that. How is how we are raised, our geography, affect our view of self? Uh, but the geography? How is the geography? Like how we are raised and where we are raised. Oh, yeah, that, yeah, okay, yeah, so, so, so that, that's really good. So, so that's, that's, that goes back to the kind of ancient Greek idea, so, as I was talking about. So why did we become individualists? Where did the idea come from? And that's because of the geography of ancient Greece. In order to get along and get ahead, in order to get status, we had to be a hustler. Um, uh, and, and the interesting thing about that is that if you look at what was going on in East Asia, in China at the same time, it was the opposite. So in, in China, um, um, everybody, it was a huge landlocked area and people were rice growers or wheat growers or working on massive irrigation projects. So in order to survive in, East, in China, two and a half thousand years ago, you had to be part of a group and you had to keep your head down and you couldn't be a hustler. 
and you couldn't push, push yourself forwards. And you still see these cultural ideas uh, uh, um, uh, very prevalent in, in East Asia today. When you, you, w w one of the experiments that psychologists do is they, they put people, they put college students in front of videos of a fish tank, weirdly. And, it, and, and the video has, the, uh, one of the things the video has is, is all these fish floating around, and there's a big fish in the middle. It's a big, like, show off orange fish. And they say to pe the Western people, what do you think of that fish? And the Westerners go, well, that's the leader. I like that fish. That was my favorite fish. But if you, but if you, if you um, show it to some Japanese or Chinese students and say, what do you think of that fish? They go, well, I felt really sorry for that fish because it had been pushed out of the group and it was obviously very unpopular. So, so, so you see how these ideas from the geography of two and a half thousand years ago are still massively influencing how we think um, today. It's really, really extraordinary stuff. Um, um, my question is just, what simple bit of advice would you give to somebody trying to find their niche in the world? What simple bit of advice um, she was trying to find the niche in the world? Um, that's a good question. I mean, yeah, it, it, it's just about, it's just, a, I think it's to remember that, 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 that point about, about status. So we, 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 we're, we're these weird tribal animals. Like, there's loads of animals that live in groups. You know, fish do... Dog, you know, wolves do like it's not a, an unusual thing. But one of the unusual things about human tribes, like chimp tribes, is, is our status is always in flux. So people, so, so it's not fixed. Like in most animals, who gets the status is the one that is the best fighter, you know, is, or, or the oldest. Whereas in human tribes, it's always moving. So, so, so we're obsessed with our sense of relative status. And I think the, the, the when, it, when you're looking at your niche, that, that's why it's important that. Is this an area that I can, be, I can be quite good at something in? Like, if you're a terrible dancer, don't try and be a dancer. Because when, when, you, when you're going into your niche, you, what you're doing is you're joining a tribe. No different, really, in a psychological sense, to the tribes that were existing in, in the African savannah 10,000 years ago. You're joining a tribe, in, to, to, as far as your subconscious mind is concerned. And in order to, to feel good in that tribe, you've got, to, you've got to feel like you're progressing and getting better and that you're... You have relative status, so you're better than some people down here. So, so that, that's what you're looking for. It's that, it's, that, it's that little world that you can exist in. Even if it's you know, collecting something like Civil War memorabilia. If, if, you, if you feel like I'm going to have a, I'm, I'm gonna be one of the better <laughs> collectors of Civil War memorabilia, as weird as that sounds, that's going to make you happy. Because you know, it, often we're not in a position where our jobs can be the thing that we're particularly good at. Because often we, that's just life. We end up in jobs that we don't like. But that's okay, because you can find that niche elsewhere. You can find that niche anywhere. But it's just about joining a group of people. And, 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 and when you're with those people, you can feel like you have some importance and respect and that you're, you have the capacity to get better and to earn more um, sense of importance and respect. That, that's kind of what you're looking for. We have time for one more question. Um, how long did it take you to write this book? Oh. Um, uh, yeah, uh, so selfie took me about four years. Yeah. Th thank you for attending today. Uh, just a reminder: we have we have uh, books of Mr. Stores in the in the library for checkout, and that concludes our program for today. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks for you, Will Store. <laughs>